Thank you, GJ. And I, before I start, I want to thank everybody at WCN for inviting me and my team back here. It's a great honor. And this is the most amazing conference I know about. So we are really happy to be here. And uh, I guess I should also say that uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a little bit different than maybe uh, some of the other talks that you've been uh, seeing. And I am going to show some graphs and some data. So, but bear with me. They aren't complicated. And uh, I think they're going to be important for understanding uh, some of the things that I'm talking about. Polar bears need sea ice to survive. They catch their prey from the surface of the ice, so ice is fundamental to their nutrition. When I first went to Alaska in the early 1980s, we had lots of sea ice. It was everywhere. Even in September, the, the month of minimum sea ice, the ice was right against the shoreline. I could stand in Barrow and see the ice and some, day, some years even walk right out onto it. Now it's a very different picture. The ice is hundreds of miles offshore in September. Beyond the horizon, you can't see it. And we've lost an area of sea ice in the summer equivalent to seven times the size of the state of California. Looking into the future, this is what the ice might look like. At the end of the century, we might have just a little bit of summer ice at the northern end of Greenland. Because polar bears depend on this ice, this is a fundamental problem for them. Now, we can stop this sea ice loss. I believe we can. And doing so will save polar bears, and it'll benefit the rest of life on Earth. Later, I'm going to tell you ways that you can help. But first, there's three important points that I want to cover. First, I want to talk about polar bear basics. Think of it as Polar Bear 101. And I should pause here and give a special thanks to Daniel Cox and his Arctic documentary project. He has provided many of the images that you're going to be seeing today. I want to talk about how global warming works. And this is where I'm going to show you a few graphs, specifically focusing and trying to help you understand when people talk about certainties and uncertainties in climate change. And then I want to show how this is a threat that goes way beyond polar bears and way beyond the Arctic. So what is a polar bear? It's the world's largest non-aquatic predator. They have feet the size of platters. They can have a 45-inch neck. And this is an animal that you can indeed put your head inside their mouth if you chose to do so. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. An adult male polar bear can stand nearly five feet high at the shoulder when standing on all fours. And when somebody like this walks up on you, if you're out working on the ice, where I've been for a lot of years, and a bear like this walks up on you, I can tell you they look as big as a house. But like all members of the bear family, they start out in life small and vulnerable. This is the kind of view that polar bear researchers are used to. We're used to looking at the top of the globe with the North Pole in the center and polar bear populations wrapping around the polar basin. In 2007, I came up with the idea that we can classify polar bears into four major ecoregions. And these are the different colors that show on this map. But the important thing is that regardless of slight differences in the sea ice in these areas and how polar bears respond, in all of them, polar bears depend on the ice for most of their life history needs. And principle of those is feeding. They feed on two species of seals, the ring seal and the bearded seal. And it's obvious why they call these bearded seals. They catch them by sneaking up on them when they're hauled out on the surface of the ice, by waiting for them at breathing holes. And this must be a terrible, uh, just a terrifying lifestyle if you're a ring seal, because you've got to breathe. And you know there might be a polar bear there waiting for you whenever you come up to take a breath. But that's the way it is. In the spring of the year, ring seals make little caves above the surface of the ice and below the surface of the snow. And it's in these caves that they give birth to their white-coated pups. This is my wife, Virginia, with a pup that we found abandoned on the ice uh, some years ago. Polar bears have become very effective at finding these structures and removing their occupants. 
It's kind of a grisly affair, but that's what they do. Polar bears depend on the surface of the ice to catch these animals. They very seldom can catch their prey in open water or on land. So polar bears have the home ice advantage. The disadvantage is that as the sea ice goes, so goes the polar bear. In 2007, I projected that if we stay on our current greenhouse gas emissions path, that we could lose two-thirds of the world's polar bears by the middle of this century, and by the end of the century, we could lose them all. Nothing has really happened since then, despite my optimism, to really change that. And unfortunately, last year, my colleagues and I published a paper showing a 40% decline in the first decade of the 2000s in the southern Beaufort Sea population. And this is the population that I spent almost my whole adult life living with and working on. So it's kind of a difficult finding. The main driver for the population decline is poorer survival resulting from more limited food supply. This often hits the young first. But regardless of whether we're talking about starving cubs or starving adults, starvation is not a pretty picture. We often get the question, well, can't polar bears just simply move on to land when the ice melts? And last year, my colleagues and I published a paper where we looked at every angle of that question, and we concluded that it wasn't very likely. But Mother Nature actually had already told us that. This is a picture of a... Uh, Arctic grizzly bear, and these animals live on the land adjacent to where the polar bears live to the north out on the sea ice. But these bears are among the smallest of the grizzly bears all across the world, and they live at very low densities. So why would we think that we could have a whole population of the world's largest bears move into a land area that currently only supports small numbers of small bears? So why are we losing the sea ice? The short answer is it's physics. In 2010, we published a paper showing that there's a linear relationship between global mean temperature and sea ice extent. There's a direct relationship between greenhouse gas concentrations and global mean temperature. The Earth maintains the temperature that we've been accustomed to because the energy from the sun comes in in shortwave radiation, goes back out into space in the form of longwave radiation, but greenhouse gases capture and delay that energy retreat back into space. And you might think, well, why, why does that energy have to get back into space? Well, if it stayed here, pretty soon the Earth would be just a ball of molten rock or hot gas. The problem is that as greenhouse gas concentrations are steadily rising, we're out of energy balance with space. There's less energy going out into space than is coming in, and it's staying longer around the Earth. So the Earth has to warm. This isn't a graph, this is just a drawing, but it precedes a couple of the graphs. So we have temperature on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, and in a time when greenhouse gas concentrations are stable, we have lots of weather and climate fluctuations, but the average of those is a level line. When greenhouse gas concentrations are steadily rising, we have a rising baseline. We still have all that natural variability, but it occurs over a steadily rising baseline. And when people talk about the uncertainties of climate change, what they're talking about is all those purple humps and bumps there. The certainty is that the world has to warm. Now, this is a graph. Same thing, though, temperature on this side and uh, time on that side, and just to show that the real data actually look like that drawing that I just described. And if we look into the future, based on climate models, we see a similar picture extending on into the future. Uh, but what about the, uh, the lines here that show a decreasing or stable trend? You see any of those? There aren't any. 
There's nothing that suggests that without changing our greenhouse gas emissions path that we can see the lines changing in their direction. Now, I said there was a relationship between temperature and sea ice extent. This is a similar graph, except now we have sea ice extent on the vertical axis, time still on the horizontal axis, and there's a lot of near-term uncertainty because of all that variation. You take the variation in temperature, you take how that might influence the changes in sea ice from year to year, you get a lot of noise in the near term. But in the long term, all of these lines ultimately converge at zero sea ice. Polar bears can definitely swim, but not indefinitely. And this is not preferred polar bear habitat. So if we don't stop the rise in greenhouse gas emissions, polar bears ultimately will disappear. But this brings me to the third point that I wanted to make, and that is that this goes way beyond polar bears. And don't get me wrong, these are my favorite creatures. I love them. I've spent most of my life with them. But I think the most important thing about polar bears right now is that they are a messenger for how we're changing the world and in ways that we might not necessarily think about. The wildfire season in the western United States is now 84 days longer than it was just in the early 1980s. The principal driver of wildfire is hot summer temperatures and low soil moisture. With steadily increasing temperatures, we're going to get more of both. This is a temperature map comparing the temperature where we are now to where we will expect to be at the end of the century if we stay on our current path. And so what you have is the different colors represent how much temperature might change. And this is degrees Celsius average annual temperature. And what we see is that over most of the United States, the temperatures will be at least four degrees or so warmer, seven and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they are now. Summer temperatures in the Rocky Mountains, in Montana, uh, Idaho, places where grizzly bears live, will be comparable to the temperatures that we currently have in central Texas. This will not bode well for other endangered species like grizzly bears. But if you don't care about northern hemisphere species or North American species, what about the Andean bear and other species in South America? Similar temperature curve, similar increase in temperature. This cannot be good for Andean bears or anything else that lives down there. If you're concerned mainly about marine mammals, same thing. This is an oceanic look at sea surface temperatures. Looking at the end of the century on our current greenhouse gas emissions path, tremendous increases in temperature. In the ocean, we also have the problem of acidification, lowering pH. We have freshening of the ocean because of melting of the ice sheets and lower oxygenation in store. All of those things will mean lower ocean productivity. I've been working with Lori Marker to try and explore how cheetahs will be affected by rising temperatures. And one of the images that we have pulled up is this one, which is a little bit different than the ones that we were, the, the temperature maps we were just looking at. This is expressing probability. The probability that the temperatures in the summertime in the range of the cheetah, the Middle East and Africa, will be warmer than anything we've ever experienced. So think about that. Hotter summers than anything we've ever experienced in any record summer in the past. And most of Africa has got a 90% probability that every summer we'll see that. That's not going to be good for cheetahs. It's not going to be good for most of the other African and, uh, wildlife that we love. Clearly, we have to continue our on-the-ground efforts. If we don't stop poaching, there's not going to be any elephants left for global warming to kill. But if we don't stop global warming, saving elephants from poaching 
is only going to be a temporary solution. And this goes for other animals that I think everybody here cares about. And it goes for people. There's lots of people living in Africa. They are going to be facing the same kind of stresses, and it's going to impact their ability to make a living. As Colleen Begg has said eloquently on this stage, hungry people can't do conservation. And if we allow the temperatures to get to the point that I just described, the governments of the world are going to be so busy dealing with humanitarian efforts that they aren't going to be thinking about polar bears or rhinos or elephants. The good news is that we can fix this. Remember the variation that I talked about, the natural variation due to the chaos in the climate system, the biggest source of variation is the choices that we make, the path that we choose to be on. We can choose to just follow that high line into some kind of dystopian future, or we can take a lower path that will result in cooler temperatures and ultimately in stabilizing. A colleague of mine calls this the difference between Mother Nature and human nature. And the human nature aspect of this is what's going to be really important. So remember we had that graph up before where we had temperature here, time here, and all of the red lines going off uh, the top of the screen. The agreement that was reached or the goals that were established in Paris are represented by the model outcomes in that blue line or approximately those lines. And you can see that not only do they hold temperatures cooler, but they actually level off by the end of the century. We showed in 2010 that if we stop the rise in greenhouse gas concentrations, we can stop the business's usual projection of sea ice down to zero. So we know that this will save polar bears. This is that temperature map again that I showed a moment ago. The probability of having every summer be a record hot summer is far diminished if we follow that lower path. So the Paris Agreement, or the, the goals established in Paris, are a really important result, a really important outcome relative to all life on Earth. We are halfway there, approximately, in terms of the countries that are contributing greenhouse gases ratifying the agreement. Real progress. But we still have problems. Many elected officials in our country, and we are largely responsible for the warming that has occurred in the world, don't want to abide by the Paris Agreement. Some think that uh, we could build a wall. I recently gave some talks in North Carolina, and while I was there, I learned that, that the politicians there have a really creative answer to uh, climate change. They have outlawed sea level rise. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, if in several hundred years the eastern seaboard of the United States looks like this, we're going to think those North Carolinians were pretty smart. <laughs> um, but I think we all know that uh, we can't just pass a law to prevent sea level rise. Polar bears and the Earth's other creatures, including us, still need some help. So where does Polar Bears International come in? I spent my life as a researcher studying polar bears, trying to understand them, publishing papers, and in 2010 I realized we already know the answer to the question of uh, what do we need to do to save them? And so I went looking around for an organization that would be a good fit for getting that word out. And Polar Bears International is it. We are an environmental education organization that also conducts and supports research. And I'm just going to trip through very quickly some of the things, oops, I went a little too fast there. Um, some of the things that we are doing at PBI, and this is certainly not a comprehensive list by any means. Um, I'm continuing to publish. Fortunately, I've been able to continue to do that. We have some interesting papers coming out. 
Uh, Jeff York, our conservation uh, director, is the head of the International Range States Conflict Working Group. So this is all of the polar bear nations, people getting together trying to figure out how to preserve polar bears that may be coming into villages and attacking people and trying to get into their houses to get food. How do we deal with that? How do we mitigate those kinds of on-the-ground impacts? Both Jeff and I are on the IUCN Polar Bear Specialist Group. PBI is the only NGO represented on that specialist group. We have 44 partners in zoos around the world that help us not only with our communication, but with researching topics that can't really be done very well in the field. We have a tremendous media impact with a potential viewing just last year of over six billion. We have a Tundra Connections program that has reached over 400,000 people around the world last year. And that's broadcasts that we do mainly from Churchill during the polar bear migration season where we have a lot of focal attention. We have approximately 8 million followers on Twitter, Instagram, the other social networks. And our website is the go-to place for polar bear information. If you do a Google search for polar bears, our website is usually one of the first websites that pops up. But we need more help. We have that resistance, especially in the United States. We need to turn that around if we are going to achieve the goals established in Paris. One of the things that you can do is you can join PBI. You can support us. You can help us magnify our reach and our capacity. And I also want to emphasize that everybody here has a personal responsibility to examine your lives, look at how you can minimize your greenhouse footprint, and most importantly, push for a fair price on carbon. This is essential. One of the main reasons that people are reluctant to deal with climate change is they're concerned about what kind of interventions the government is going to make in our lives. Are they going to tell us we can't drive a certain car or we have to take mass transit or we have to keep our house at 60 degrees? If we had an international price on carbon that everybody agreed to, then the free markets of the world could figure out the rest. How do we achieve that? So this is a really important and practical way to go. By doing these things, you can help assure a better future for all future generations. You can learn more about us at polarbearsinternational.org. Uh, you can go to wildnet.org. And uh, you know we have a table here. Uh, there's lots of ways you can find out about us. I thank you in advance for everything that you will do. <clears throat>